A very warm welcome to the news in details. Now, the Secretary General of the International Organization of La Francophonie, Louise Mushikiwabo, has announced that the organization will continue supporting education and capacity building among the youth because young people account for more than 70% in the populations of most of its member states. Now, the Secretary General made the announcement as International Francophonie Day was marked on Sunday in different parts of Kigali City on Sunday, banners and flags depicting the em emblems of the international organization of La Francophonie could be seen as the country joined other member states to mark the day with the theme focusing on the youth. The French embassy in Rwanda has started Francophonie clubs in schools as a way of reinforcing the importance of the young people to the country's future, calling on them not to waste the opportunities that have, be have been available to them. The international organization of La Francophonie currently has 24 volunteers in Rwanda training French language secondary school teachers and intends to increase the number in the near future. Moving on, more than 39 billion Rwandan francs has been earmarked by the government of Rwanda in helping the transport sector in terms of ensuring that the travel fares do not continue to rise beyond the capacity of the people due to rising global petrol prices. Fuel prices continue to rise sharply in the international market, affecting the prices of various goods and services in Rwanda, including the rising of travel fares across the country. The government of Rwanda has decided to provide financial assistance to the transport sector in order to keep the travel costs from going up. Many passengers and public transport drivers were happy about this, although they are happy with this. Some of the public transport drivers say that since the decision was made, prices have continued to rise, saying that the cost of public transport has continued to fall so low that they are operating at a loss, as this assistance did not consider the reduced capacity of passengers due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the Prime Minister, Dr. Edouard Ndirene, recently told reporters that the government's assistance prevented the prices from hiking, which would have happened if they had not assisted. About 39.3 billion Rwanda francs have been provided by the government of Rwanda to public transport sector since May last year to March this year. The speakers of the Rwandan and Gabonese parliaments have signed an agreement that is geared towards reinforcing the level of cooperation between the two parliaments. Take a look. The agreement is meant to facilitate the sharing of information between the two legislative bodies. We want to be able to learn from each other and emulate achievements on both sides, be it on a political and technical level, with discussions held on what sort of improvements can be made, all that for the benefit of the people we represent in Rwanda and Gabon, respectively. Following the signing of the agreement, committees were immediately formed by both sides to follow up on the implementation. Nous avons donc signé entre nos deux chambres. We signed this agreement in our respective capacities with the objective of boosting the bilateral relations that exist between us, but also to be able to exchange our experiences. The Gabonese parliamentary delegation that also held discussions with the Speaker of Rwanda's Parliament is in the country for three days and on Saturday visited the Kigali Special Economic Zone. People working as builders and other professions in the construction industry have been called upon to have integrity in all they do because being dishonest only tarnishes their reputation and negatively affects their work. On Saturday, the builders launched week-long activities dedicated to the profession in Kigali City by constructing houses at the Nghusi site in Jeli sector, where 170 homes for people displaced by natural disasters are to be relocated. Now, 12 percent of all builders are women, most of them masonry assistants. Take a look. With the profession dominated by men, the few women who work as builders told us that things were hard for them when they started out, but with time they got better at what they do and confidence in their skills increased. All builders, regardless of gender, understand that integrity is an integral part of their profession. I'm 
Some builders check that the site manager is not watching and start misbehaving, not properly mixing the cement and leaving dents in the pavement, just so they can hurry and get the job done and over with. When you do such things, you ruin your reputation, and sooner or later no one will hire you because you cause losses for contractors. Some builders provide inaccurate measures looking to steal cement. Others write up unnecessarily long lists of required materials and don't buy most of them, just looking to make even more money for themselves. The structures they erect rarely meet the required minimum safety standards, causing the owner losses and potentially putting people's lives at risk. The trade union that brings together those working in the construction industry says it is striving to ensure the utmost professionalism among its members. Because most builders are paid their wages in cash, they use up their money right away and are unable to save any of it. Because of that, during the total lockdown, some of them had no food to eat, requiring government support when there are people that have been working for years. People with bank accounts are not as tempted to waste their money and have more opportunities to save up for things like projects. That can help get rid of the saying that when a builder is too old to continue in the profession, they end up as night watchmen guarding the very structures they constructed years before. Twelve percent of the more than 68,000 builders of the Stekoma Trade Union are women, the vast majority of them masonry assistants. Farmers in the districts of Chirehe, Gatsibo and Guamagana who had construct who had constructed to supply who had, who had contracts to supply maize cobs to Izimano Industries Limited say they produce no more longer uh, has a viable market and they are no longer able to use fertilizers like they used to. They are asking that the processing plant be reopened so that they are not forced to sell to middlemen who demand exploitative prices. Those told us that the maize processing plant shutting down was a severe blow to their developmental efforts. <laughs> The processing plant at Kayonza used to loan us fertilizers that we would later pay back slowly. Then we got news that it was closed. Now most of our maize is bought by middlemen at atrocious prices and farmers end up losing money. Farmers use a lot of money to grow this maize and now without even fertilizers. Isimano Industries Limited used to also carry out its corporate social responsibilities helping local residents to develop on different fronts, which only made the pinch worse for the people when it shut down. The factory used to sort out rice, make flour, as well as briquettes for cooking stoves. It closed two years ago because of unpaid taxes. <laughs> I was being supplied by the farmers with no problems, giving them fertilizers and even lending them money. Then came along the middlemen and they cut that supply by half. To make matters worse, they claimed to be buying the produce on my behalf. So when the auditors came, my taxes were grossly inflated. They said I owed slightly more than 1.9 billion Northern francs. And so I went to Rwanda Revenue Authority to see the commissioner about it, where I was informed that what I owed was in fact closer to 3.8 billion Rwandan francs. I almost fainted. My factory was immediately closed because I also had a bank loan to pay. Augustine is asking for leniency in the matter and his factory to be allowed to reopen because he insists what happened was not his fault. I am asking that the figure be revised and I am willing to get back to work and pay those taxes because I really had no reason whatsoever to be dishonest. When my factory was initially doing well and I was playing my part in nation building, I had no reason to be dishonest. As much as 3.5 billion northern francs had been invested in Izimano Industries Limited and its machines were processing as much as 50 tons of rice, 30 tons of maize and making 10 tons of briquettes every day with 100 employees on salary and 35 working as day laborers on wages. 
Efforts have begun in Yagate district to provide 8,000 homes with electricity. When this latest drive is concluded, 70% of houses in the district will have power. Half of Nyagatare's 14 sectors are being targeted in this latest push for energy distribution, and beneficiaries are very happy about it. I feel like a very important person now that I have electricity. We were like people living in darkness, and now we have come into the light. The first thing I'm going to do is buy a TV. Then I will buy a machine for grinding and other accessories that use electricity. I see development all over the country and it is clear that President Kagame thinks about people like us a lot. Now that we have power, those who can afford them will buy machines to grind things like maize cobs and young people like us will open up barber shops. We were going to charge our phones and to have our hair cut in far off places like Ndego and Changhuanzi. And now we are going to get such facilities right here. We are very grateful to the President of the Republic and would applaud him if we were to see him. Officials of the Rwanda Energy Group in Yagatari District say the operation will not stop until their set objectives are attained. This operation of energy distribution in Yagatari District will last for one month, two at the most. This time around, we intend to provide electricity to 8,000 homes, that is in addition to the 2,000 we gave last time. Meaning come June this year, we will have attained our objective to provide electricity to 10,000 homes during this current fiscal year. 60.1% of homes in Yagatari district currently have electricity and when this latest drive is over, that figure will be at 70%. Some of the youth say they are worried about the behavior of their peers who agree to engage in promiscuity, regardless of the serious consequences they could face, including unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases such as HIV AIDS. Major Lakini of Nyaza district in the southern province says that abortions are now common among adolescents, which is a clear indication that there was carelessness on the girl's side and on the man that impregnated her. They expressed concern about the rising incidence of HIV in young people because sometimes these pregnancies are accompanied by AIDS. AIDS is a dangerous disease and we should prevent it. For example, if we are to engage intimately, we use protection. The youth believe that some of their peers say they are no longer afraid of HIV, claiming that the antiretroviral drugs are easily accessible and available free of charge. Of the 49 pregnant girls who were admitted at the Kagugu Health Center in Kigali during the last three months of 2021, 13 were infected with HIV AIDS. The concerns of youth about their peers who become pregnant and contract HIV AIDS are shared by parents. Some believe that the use of drugs is among the influences but also that some parents are not giving their children enough guidance to help them avoid it. I think there has been a backslide because we see children in primary getting pregnant, escaping school, which means some parents are no longer playing their role or having talks with their children and they just leave them. The head of Kagugu Health Center, Dogo Trezor, says that if only these girls had arrived at the health center soon after they had sex, they would have been protected from getting pregnant and suffering from AIDS. Not only children, but even adults who want to protect themselves from unwanted pregnancies or HIV can come to us, even those who have been sexually assaulted. We help them regardless if they are adults or minors, but the latter are the priority. According to the Rwanda Biomedical Center, HIV AIDS has remained a serious threat and everyone should make sure to protect themselves from acquiring it and protect others as well. Health authorities are reminding the public, especially young people, to take part in getting tested to determine their status. According to RBC, most young people are not taking tests for HIV and even those who have been diagnosed with HIV virus do not take their antiretroviral drugs consistently as they should. 
International Alert has been implementing Duhuze activity from June 2017 to March 2022 in seven districts in Rwanda with the support of USAID. The program was intended to complement uh, the efforts put in place by the Ministry of National Unity and Civic Engagement Rwanda on Friday in Kigali City. Sidi Patel reports. International Alert is an independent and international peace-building organization with the support of USAID and Ministry of National Unity and Civic Engagement, Minu Bumwe, had been implementing Duhuze activity for 57 months commencing from June 2017 and ending in March 2022. The event held today in Kigali City was to respond to challenges affecting the processes of unity and reconciliation revealed by the findings of the 2015 Reconciliation Barometer. Through the Duhuze project, International Alert sought to contribute to the consolidation of a peaceful Rwanda society through enhanced citizens' participation and ownership of reconciliation processes to maximize its impact on Rwandan lives. International Alert was in partnership with ARCT Ruhuka, Rwandese Association of Trauma Counselors, and AG Prado Jijukira, a Rwandan human rights-based organization, has been implementing this project in 21 sectors in seven districts. <laughs> emotional that I felt that I would not have to deal with that grief and lack of sleep and peace. It was time to forgive and forget for peace and to see how I could continue to build and progress. I was able to return into society in 2007 because I had admitted my guilt, but it was difficult for me because I regularly saw the people we had wronged and I carried a great burden with me. I came close to running away a few times, avoiding contact with them at all costs. I was afraid of them because of the crimes I had committed. Duhuze therefore greatly helped us by bringing about unity and reconciliation because it put our hearts at ease. It brought us together with genocide survivors, the people we wronged, and we asked them for forgiveness and they forgave us. The targeted groups were genocide survivors and their descendants, historically marginalized people, new and old case returnees, intermarriage spouses and their children. The project overreached the target following the awareness raising campaign on psychosocial wounds and trauma, intergenerational trauma. The project was about healing the wounds, bringing people together, using a sectoral approach in trying not only to heal wounds but also to handle social economic issues of uh, people to create those spaces or platforms where people can meet, discuss and exchange not only among uh, genocide survivors and genocide perpetrators but also among different categories of Rwandans. We are planning to have Multisectoral approach. 60% of them are youth in the Duhuze project who has helped their parents to reunite and relearn the history of Rwanda and performed dramas for easy understanding. That we are working in close collaboration again with the government to make sure that we are aligning with their priorities and their approach and that we are also able to support our implementing partner to make sure they have the support they need to have an impact. Oftentimes, USAID is an international agency of development for the U.S. government can draw on its own expertise and our experience in other countries also facing similar issues of reconciliation, healing, conflict, trauma, awareness. We can help our partners here to share best practices. We have people who have healed, who have moved a step to, to forgive, to request for forgiveness. We have asked young people, particularly the ones that we, we target, to take a step and support and dis disconnect themselves from the intergenerational discourse of hate, which is a really very important part of why this project was targeting young people. Because we believe that the future of this country belongs to the young people and it's them to take forward this journey of reconciliation. So I really don't think there would be any completely any, any setback in any of this. I'm very confident that these people have moved another chapter in their lives and they're going to continue doing the same work even across the country. 
intended therapy groups were to be 300 only but they succeeded to commence 472 therapy groups with over 5000 members 896 people have reconciled the leaders in faith and organizations schools as teachers and local leaders were chosen to help them to stop bullying and teasing in schools and communities selfless services by members of the groups has constructed 99 houses 52 houses has been repaired and 300 latrines has been built Over 38,000 people were supported and 400 million Rwandan francs was transacted in the joint economic activities which has tremendous improvement in the daily lives and personality. Siddhi Patel, RTV News. That's all for today on behalf of the entire news production team. Thank you so much for your company. I'm Jane Mutoni. Bye for now.